For China to be an imperialist power comparable to that of the West, it will have to do a number of things. One, kill off millions of Africans, mm -hmm. enslave millions of Africans, seize African land, set up plantations and work Africans in those plantations, then create a colonial system where you, 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 you impose Chinese values and Chinese ways of life. You create a hierarchy in which China and Russia are at the top and the Africans are treated at this, a racist culture that continues to inform the world. And every um, ever so often you go and bomb these societies because they have governments that disagree with you. Hello everyone, I'm Rania Kalik and this is Dispatches. We're told that countries across the global south are poor and plagued by violence because of internal problems. They're ruled by corrupt and greedy people who seem to be innately authoritarian and backwards due to some sort of cultural deficiency that prevents respect for human rights and causes state failure. Forget colonialism, imperialism, never-ending Western wars, resource theft, and destabilization campaigns. It's just the way those inferior people of the global south happen to be. This colonial and racist discourse is being further reinforced across Western institutions to propagandize against growing ties between global South countries and Russia and China, especially with regard to Africa, while covering up the broader structural and historical conditions that Western imperialism created. You see, countries across Africa are deepening their bonds with Russia and China, not to benefit African economies and people. Africans aren't capable of such things but rather because they're corrupt and dictatorial by nature, or because they're being forced to do so by the big bad Russians and Chinese. To discuss the colonial and racist framework used by Western policymakers to justify ongoing imperialist aggression in Africa and how it's being folded into the new Cold War on Russia and China, I'm joined by Zubayru Wai, Associate Professor of Political Science and Global Development Studies at the University of Toronto. But before we jump into it, this is just the first half of this episode. The second half is available for Breakthrough News members only. You can become a member at patreon.com slash breakthrough news. And as always, be sure to hit the subscribe button and the bell so you get a notification whenever we post new content. And if you appreciate the show, you can also donate below on YouTube. Zubayru, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Um, and this is a pleasure, by the way, I have to say, um, I have been a big fan of yours since you were at Soapbox. I think oh. it's a Soapbox? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Well, that's really kind of you to say and nice to hear. And I'm really, I mean, your work is incredible. So I'm, it's really my pleasure to have you on uh, so that our audience can get to know uh, you and the incredible stuff that you've been working on. Um, and I'm so excited to have this conversation because I think it's like very relevant to everything taking place uh, today, especially as Africa is in the news a lot more, <laughs> particularly West Africa and the kind of discourse yeah. we're hearing. Yeah. Um, but before we get into sort of like the specifics and nitty gritty about a lot of the, the academic work that you've done on sort of like interrogating and analyzing the discourse that's used to frame a lot of these countries in the global south with particular focus mm -hmm. on Africa when it comes to like talking about state failure, or state collapse and these sorts of things. I, I think it'd be interesting to maybe open with the way that China and Russia are discussed in relation to Africa increasingly in Western media and by Western policymakers uh, because of this fear of the rise of China and Russia and as they escalate yeah. this new Cold War. And, you know, what I'm talking about here is like all of this rhetoric around corruption, the state failure discourse that you have done a lot of work on is being used in the context of the U.S. Cold War on Russia and China. Absolutely. And that sort of like critique of Russian and Chinese supposed imperialism in Africa. So I think let's start with this. How would you classify Russia and China's relationship with African countries? Do you think it qualifies as imperialist and why or why not? Okay, I will fight anybody and I'll challenge anybody. And thanks very much. Um, um, this is actually a good way of opening, right? But I'll fight and challenge anybody who says that China and Russia are imperialist powers in Africa. That's off the bat. And before I, I tackle this, let, let me take a circuitous route and, and yes. say, I was born and raised in Sierra Leone, right? And so when I was little in the, in the 80s, the mid 80s thereabout, and this was 
about the time that structural adjustment was just beginning to ravage our communities and societies. Um, there is this place we used to go to. They call the place China Farm. So now what exactly is China Farm? Well, um, China Farm basically was um, um, one of like about 10 small to medium size rice uh, multiplication and demonstration centers around the country where Chinese experts were experimenting um, with, with, with local, the local rice crop because normally in Sierra Leone, the, the indigenous rice crop, which is indigenous to that area, is grown only in the rainy season. So the rainy season starts somewhere in May and ends somewhere in September, October. And then the dry season starts, right? So you have a six month period in which you plant rice and the yield um, may not be that great, but you spend like the six months. So what the Chinese were doing basically in China farm was to set up this rice experiment, the experimentation centers that allowed them to experiment with reducing or producing this hybrid form of rice between the Chinese rice and, and the local rice yield in order to be able to transform it into a short-term harvestable, harvestable high-yield um, crop, right? And so China Farm actually is just one of um, several active what you might want to call integrated agricultural aid program of China in Africa. For example, you have like the Kappa tree rice um, seed multiplication in Liberia. There was the, the, Mba, the, the, the Mbarali state farm um, in, in Tanzania, um, which basically was like 2,500 2, hectares of irrigated rice, which was completed with hydropower station, um, dairy farms and all of this stuff, right? Why am I um, I'm going to this? It's because there is a historical relationship between China and Africa. And people evacuate that. And we forget about all of this, right? Actually, in Sierra Leone, the main ministerial building, which was built in the 70s, is known as UE building. UE being one in Chinese or in Mandarin. So basically, it's saying... You people and our people, the state of Sierra Leone and China are one people. To this day, the main minister, so having said that, I am not in any way saying that China's economic interests have not changed over time. But even if we were to look at the structural foundation of Chinese um, economic activity in, Sierra, in, in Africa, it's not the same as the West. Mm -hmm. Because for China to be imperialistic, and I'll come to Russia in a minute, but let me start with China because Russia, the only reason why they hate Russia is because Russia is rebelling against the unipolar world order. That's just what it is. But China is really what is their focus. But the structural foundation of Chinese um, economic activity in, in Africa does not lead to the drainage of, of wealth. It does not lead to the drainage of resources. It does not lead to the drainage of financial um, 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 resources. If anything, it's actually allowing African states to be able to um, strengthen their position to negotiate the international financial system that is based on Western imperialism. And when I talk of Western imperialism, I'm not just talking about um, Atlantic slavery or colonialism. I'm talking actually of the last 30 years when structural adjustment came to our societies, it decimated those societies. And I'll end on this before I move on to, 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 to Russia. Take Zambia. Everybody was like, oh, um, Chinese debt trap. Hillary Clinton, that destroyed Libya, is the one that has become somebody who already cares for Africa. Like, are you serious? Right? Okay. So they are talking about Zambia. How, but the Zambia um, 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 financial crisis or debt crisis is not because of Chinese loans, because China is investing in infrastructure and it's long term investment. It's the short term euro bond markets that actually function to drain economic resources out of these societies. And so then what did the IMF and the World Bank do when they came to Zambia? You have to stop your Chinese funded projects. Who is the imperialist here? Like what are people talking about when they talk about China? And, and the, the issue here with China and, and Russia, and I'll come to Russia one, one, in, one, in a minute, is that the entrance actually 
since 85 or let's say the, the late 70s, 80s, when IMF came to our societies, through structural adjustment, destroyed those societies. We have two decades or three decades of, of lost uh, productivity in Africa. It was only the Chinese entrance into the African market, like actually increasing their presence when after the war ended, for instance, in Sierra Leone, when the war ended, the Chinese came back in 2003 and started reactivating all of that agricultural um, and cooperation and technical cooperation that they had. It was only then that we started having this weird debate about Africa rising and the West was taking credit for Africa rising. But if you check the figures from 2011 to 2016, which was the height of Chinese investment in Africa, it was actually Chinese funds and loans and infrastructure that allowed Africa to be able to finally get out of the funk that structural adjustment had played, placed them in. So what exactly are people talking about? <laughs> in relation to Russia, Russia does not need Africa's resources. And I'm going to say this. Anybody could quote me on this. Borrell, two days ago, was saying Russia is a gas station masquerading I mean, with a nuclear weapon. And this is what is getting them into trouble in Ukraine and all of this, right? Mm -hmm. Because the German economy is, is being destroyed. The Eurozone is in high inflation because the Russian resources that was funding their economic development and, and growth and sustaining their growth has been undercut. And now, and so Russia does not need, in fact, the Russia-Africa summit, the reason why Africa gravitates to China and Russia there is a historical foundation to this. That's one. But secondly, the anti-colonial struggle, take South Africa, take um, Namibia, take um, Angola, um, um, and Mozambique, Guinea-Bissau, these are countries, in fact, let's not, these are countries that basically the Soviet Union helped mm -hmm. in order to get out of the colonial violence that have been placed in their societies. And so what exactly, I think part of this is that there is, and, and I'll end on this, right? There is always this misanthropic skepticism when it comes to Africa, where we believe that Africans are incapable, they are children, and incapable of making informed decisions. But when you hear the president of Namibia checking the German envoy, it's like, oh, China, it's like, why is it that you guys come here and you talk about China? China is not a problem. Even like Kufo in Ghana, they say, China is not a problem for us. Maybe in the United States, you guys are obsessed with China or in the West. <laughs> it's, right? And so that's, that's really the issue. There is a historical relation that goes to the anti-colonial struggle and state-making formations in these societies in which Russia, and now you could say it was the Soviet Union, but the Soviet Union, Russia is the successor state of the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. Which means all of the bad and the good of the Soviet Union. It's Russia, like, and this is why they are also moving them into this new Cold War, right? They are trying to ramp up these societies because they, are, they want to wage war on, on, on China. Like, it, it makes no sense. China cannot be imperialistic because imperialism involves a particular form of, a, a part of the capitalist world system that allows for draining of resources, economic exploitation, that render, even though those states are formally independent, it makes them economically dependent. And China is allowing these states to be able to get out of, of that situation. Right. And that's the big problem, right? Because we have to keep uh, African countries particularly, but of course, a lot of these countries in the global south and this like sub submissive yeah. uh, role. And then China offers this alternative. And, you know, it's yeah. interesting because like a lot of the discourse that you've written about in terms of it being colonial and racist in the way that Africa has talked about, uh, a lot of this discourse has also been used against China and Russia, I would say as well. Oh, absolutely. Right? Yeah. So like as China and Russia at the same time, they're also, they, they come out of, you know, being these uh, poor, in many ways, developing countries that you could consider in many ways a part of the global South, even though maybe Russia's like North. Um, but regardless, I mean, I guess, you know, do you like, we're going to talk about a lot of this discourse, but it seems like if like what you're saying is it's like, it's, it goes back to how it's described, right? If any country in Africa moves closer to China or Russia or has like some new trade like relationship or some sort of memorandum of understanding or some sort of new economic relationship or joins Belt and Road, right? Mm -hmm. um, if an African country does this, it's not out of mutual interest, but it's because that country 
has some sort of backwards cultural deficiency, right? Almost like they have a shared value with the supposed anti-democratic and corrupt nature of, you know, big, bad China and Russia. <laughs> I mean, you, you saw um, during the Russia military action in Ukraine, the beginning, I was horrified because, you know, you write about this stuff and you hope secretly that it has changed or things are changing, right? And then Ukraine happened. Oh my God, they were actually saying, so I actually ended up having a fight with somebody on Twitter, a, a colleague of mine, who was oh. basically trying to say Russian action in Ukraine is brutal, it's more brutal than what the Americans did in Afghanistan. And I was like, I'm not gonna have this, I'm not gonna have this. <laughs> yeah. Actually the Russians see um, Ukraine as part of its cultural and civilizational belt. And so even though it is violent, what they are doing, it has been tamed. Don't, let's, not, let's not even, let's not prevaricate around this. It has been tamed. The US is basically bombing wedding parties. Mm. But, but take Libya. They destroyed, this was the, the most prosperous country in, in Africa at the time. They destroyed this country and it didn't only stop there. Here is the point, when, African, when the African Union actually came with a peace mission and you saw that in relation to ukraine too they were like oh the monkeys are like you guys just stay you you don't have anything to do with this right but when the african union came up with a peace plan and went to um basically the united nations and stuff what did the eu and the americans tell the news reports will say the african union says we should do this but the international community does not agree what does that tell you Africa is not part of the international community. The mm -hmm. international community is actually Europe and the United, the Euro-American world. And, 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 and this happened. So I saw somebody saying Russia has gone to its Asiatic route. I saw a German academic saying that Russia does not even have, does not belong to the same civilizational belt as that of Germany. I'm like, Germany? Sounds Genocidal like Germany is the one that thing is, to say, right? I know, right? right? Like you are the one who is actually going and trying to tell people um, where they belong and where they do not belong. But all of this boils down to, um, I think it boils down to something which is very ingrained in Western psyche. There is this um, structure of feeling that says only us can govern the world and everybody else is supposed to be um, our subject, and if you do not listen, then um, we'll have to put you in your place. It, but uh, the, the second thing is that the West is incapable of seeing anybody within the context of their own rationality. Mm. So they will look at China and Russia through their own lens, the way in which they will look at themselves. What they see in the mirror is what they are projecting. So when they talk about um, um, Chinese imperialism or Russian imperialism, I was like, okay, for China to be an imperialist power comparable to that of the West, it will have to do a number of things. One, kill off millions of Africans, mm -hmm. enslave millions of Africans, seize African land, set up plantations and work Africans in those plantations, then create a colonial system where you, 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 you impose Chinese values and Chinese ways of life. You create a hierarchy in which China and Russia are at the top and the Africans are treated at this, a racist culture that continues to inform the world. And every um, ever so often you go and bomb these societies because they have governments that disagree with you. If, if China is not even next to that, then the comparison does not even arise. We, we should not be having this conversation in the first place, right? But we are only having this conversation because the West, and, and, and part of it is one, there is an arrogance that says we are at the top of the world, which is a colonial um, um, imperialist mentality. It is racist at its foundation, but it is colonial and imperialistic because imperialism is also about this idea that um, others deserve and demand um, um, domination and only the West can, can do that. That is one. And the second thing in all of this then is to say, because to do that, I mean, you are dependent on, Europe does not provide, produce anything. Let's, let's just put it this way. <laughs> right. They never did. They can't. They don't have the right climate. Exactly. They don't have the right land. Yeah. It's like Europe is literally the creation of the third world. Mm -hmm. That is a quote. Like, and when you think about it, because the wealth that this small does is what 
that which has been stolen from the brown and black and yellow peoples and yellow races. And when you think of it, it makes sense. So this is why you have to constantly, on, on the one hand, project yourself into somebody else, and then two, but you also want to come up with these discourses in order to be able to justify um, why you should continue siphoning resources from everybody else. Right. Yeah, it's like mass. It's like gaslighting on a global scale. Oh, exactly. <laughs> um, you know, so I want to, I want to, I want to dissect some of the discourse that is like sort of underpinning a lot of this ideology. And mm -hmm. this goes to a lot of the work that you've done, a lot of the academic work that you've done, which I was yeah. recently introduced to, and I'm so happy I was. Um, yeah. And one one argument that you make uh, is about the idea of internalizing conflict as a yeah. form of propaganda. And in one yeah. of your uh, papers on this particular topic, you write, and I'm quoting you, uh, you, I propose a critical interrogation of the dominant interpretations of the post-Cold War conflicts in order to show the political nature of these interpretations and how they internalize the causes of these conflicts. By internalization of these conf or by internalization, I refer to the move to locate the causes of conflict in internal sources. Put differently, it is the assumption that the causes of conflict are in endogenously uh, located in local conditions bound to what is seen as the internal dysfunctions of these societies. Mm -hmm. My focus is in not, not on explaining the conflicts themselves, but on the politics of their interpretation. The region of, an, of emergence of the dominant interpretations of the post-Cold War conflicts and the internalization of their causes is the move by the West to ideologically suppress or discredit third world anti-colonial solidarity and world making. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a fantastic, very academic way to put that. But I guess in layman's terms, can you explain your argument here and why it still matters today? Okay. So thank you. By the way, reading that, like I'm hearing, I'm like, oh, you make me sound so smart. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're your words. <laughs> but, but, but let's, um, let's do this, right? So I want to start by saying that whatever happens in the 90s is really the realization of American um, um, imperial vision. Mm. What do I mean? So at the end of the, the Second World War, towards the end of the Second World War, the Americans actually had um, a dream of world domination. And that was en 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 encapsulated in the idea of one worldism, right? So the ideology of world, world, one worldism was going to be the foundation of a post-war post world order under American le leadership. Now, people might not know this, and, and you, you be out, Bear with me I, because I really want to, to, to go through this, right? So when Wilkie, Wilkie was the Republican nominee for president in 1940 and he lost to Roosevelt, right? But he had an understanding of one worldism, which basically ultimately was about world government under American leadership, right? But um, um, Roosevelt, however, won the election and his own idea of one worldism was going to be the end the, where under American leadership, the economic dimensions will be handled by, by the Bretton Woods system and the United Nations will be the political expression of this one worldist American um, and domination. So the point here is that as formal colonialism was ending and the second world war was ending, which meant that European, um, the European colonial powers were also weakened. The Americans were thinking of creating um, a global empire, which was not going to be based on the way in which Europe did it, but it was an informal empire that is going to be under American leadership. The Soviet rebellion, which is basically what the Cold War is, was what ultimately um, put off this one worldism vision. And so then we moved on from one worldism to Free worldism, if, 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 right? So the free world versus the communist world and what have you. But during this period, um, under Truman, one worldism became free worldism and development. And if you, during this period, then development then became the American mechanism of trying to bribe everybody to bring them within the American camp. But then there was also the US military, which militarized these societies and started going after everybody. In Indonesia, like the, the, the communist program, the anti-communist program, for instance, 
is said to have killed between 500,000 and, and 3 million people, right? In Angola, in, in, in Algeria, in, in, in South Africa, the Americans were doing all of this. So whatever it is that they have been trying to do was put off, and then the Cold War ended. If you remember, when the Cold War ended, what did Bush say? We are now going to go to a new world order. The new world order is going to be based on the Americans. And so what was realized, what they have been trying to realize since the end of the Second World War was what was actually now realized in the post-9-11 and the post-Cold War era. Well, initially, they started approaching it by liberal peace building and liberal um, global uh, how do you call it now? Good neighborliness, right? And then 9-11 happened and that destroyed everything. Right. And then the Americans became like this, like really violent imperialistic power and we were able to see. This time you can't even hide it. Now, why am I giving you this background history? Because this history is central to the way in which Southern conflicts eventually will come to be explained. Because part of that history also was that to go against any society or any government that had, um, that's, even if you are not socialist, if you had um, an independent perspective in foreign policy, like, like Syria, for instance, mm -hmm. they will come after you. Right. right. If you do not toe their line, they will come after you. And the way in which the Americans did this, they used economic mechanisms, the IMF and the World Bank, like structural adjustment in the 80s was actually, was produced by this because it was a crisis generating mechanism. Let's not forget, in the 70s, there were actually, um, in the 60s, end of 60s, early 70s, um, Nixon decided to stop um, the convertibility of the US currency because Vietnam was basically kicking their butt. Mm -hmm. And the Euro dollar market has grown out of the reach and so they were like okay for for the united states to be able to restore its economic um and power was to basically rethink all of these these processes right and so what then that it led to a crisis a crisis that ultimately manifested itself in the debt crisis in balance of payments crisis and the imf and the world bank under american leadership now came and said where you need to get rid of those economic redistributive ideas in your societies, because that is what is responsible. So I was born and raised in Sierra Leone. I went to school um, at a time when we had free school lunch program. I went to school when they would give us uniform. I went to school when they would give us books, free books. If you are sick, you will go to the hospital for free. But then by the time I was in middle school, even the food on our plates has started disappearing. And when structural adjustments came, you had to stand in long queues to, in order to be able to get rice, the staple. Now, from 85, 86, when structural adjustments came to Sierra Leone, to 91, there was already a civil war. And, but we want to explain it as if, oh, the government is corrupt. Mm -hmm. But then this is what Tandika will say, but if you say these governments were corrupt, they were still growing in the 60s. So did they just discover corruption in the 70s and 80s? <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> right? They, they were still, the economy was still functioning. Yeah. So it's not the internal dynamics. Now, this is not to say that we do not have problems within these societies. But normally, even modernization or the explanation of development, it's always about these societies um, Modernization will say, oh, it's the internal um, makeup, the traditional nature and backwardness of their economies that lead to underdevelopment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Whereas dependency, I will say, actually, no, there is a capitalist world system in which we are embedded, and then there is a way in which the core countries, through histories and structures that they have created, are in a position to siphon off resources um, and, and value from, from, from the periphery countries, right? But the explanation always is because the societies are backward. It is, and normally when this happens, the response to these problems is also to bring in more of the, the very thing that had led to the crisis in, 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 in a way. So internalization in this sense then is that we evacuate history, we evacuate geopolitics, we evacuate um, the larger structural foundations within which these things occur, and we focus merely on the, what you might even want to call the presentism of the now. There is an internal problem within the societies and everything is as a result 
of their backward societies. I and think what that the, Oh, yes, I just really on, quickly, I really quickly just <laughs> wanted to show that because I think this perfectly encapsulates what you're saying. Yeah. And you you specifically mentioned this piece by Robert Kaplan in the in the paper that that um, I quoted from earlier. And this mm -hmm. is specifically about Sierra Leone. I yeah. just want to show the language that was being used. Uh, this was published back in 1994. 94. Um, and for those who are just listening, I'm showing a, an article from The Atlantic from the February 1994 issue. It's by Robert Kaplan. It's titled The Coming Anarchy. And then the subheading says how scarcity, crime, overpopulation, tribalism, and disease are rapidly destroying the social fabric of our planet. Of our planet. Of our planet. And then it goes on to open discussing um, discussing what's happening in Sierra Leone. Mm -hmm. um, and I just wanted to really quickly just like quote this one, this one brief part of it. Tyranny is nothing new in Sierra, Le in Sierra Leone or the rest of West Africa, <laughs> but it is now part and parcel of an increasing lawlessness that is far more significant than any coup rebel incursion or episodic experiment in democracy. And then it goes on to just like use this sort of language to continue to characterize West Africa and mm -hmm. then like makes this argument that this is like a huge problem for everybody, not just these countries, but mm -hmm. actually like it's a security crisis for the US, for Europe. Anyways, I just wanted to reference that language just to like give some, um, I guess, tangible like evidence mm -hmm. of the sort of framework that you're talking about, because this is because what you talk about in your article, too, is this sort of analysis by, you know, thinkers like Robert Kaplan uh, and others in media helped offer like ideological um, justifications for Western mm -hmm. policymakers. But pl please go ahead. I'll let you take it from there. No, <laughs> thank you for bringing this up. Right. I mean, Kaplan. And now people will say, oh, many people in the West did not agree with Kaplan. Actually. This has been the basis of American policymaking. Because the, there is a misreading of Kaplan, right? So Robert Kaplan basically was a journalist. Um, now he, he teaches at the US War College, and so that tells you the pipeline, right? But there is another piece that he published in, two, uh, I think in the 2000s, where he was actually saying, what is happening in Ukraine? Kaplan had already foreseen. The Eastern Europe has manpower. The Americans can regain, can defeat China and Russia, or can contain Russia by using manpower in Eastern Europe. Sounds familiar? Is that not what is happening? I mean, so this guy is like really on the extreme, but for me, he's actually mainstream. Mm -hmm. Because what he was basically saying, the war in Sierra Leone was happening, right, in the 90s. And then he just, like this safari African Africanist, you have, um, Western scholars who claim to study Africa, they go for two weeks on safari, they drink, stay on the beach and do stuff, and then they come and write about the place as if nobody exists and they are the ones who have discovered Africa, right? And that's really what I mean in the language that they use. But the point with Kaplan is that Kaplan is significant because what he did, he made the, okay, let me back up. So the Cold War ended and the Americans were excited. There was a triumphalism in the West that the Cold War has ended. We have defeated the Soviet Union. Fukuyama even did write about the end of history, if you remember. Mm -hmm. The end of history, history has ended. Oh, the, all, of, all of us do not exist. It's the West that determines what happens, and liberal democracy is going to be the final government and stuff, as if liberal democracy has ever taken hold of any society, a, 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 a part of the, the, the very procedural nature of the way in which democracy functions. But that's a conversation we'll have on another day, right? Mm -hmm. And so... Um, they, there was this triumphalism. Kaplan was the first, and then the war started happening. Oh, but the Soviet Union was supposed to, to be the bad guys. They were the ones that were responsible for all of this violence. How is it now that wars are happening? So that post-Cold War, new world order that Bush, the father, was uh, priding himself for, was coming, like beginning to shatter. It was Kaplan that first made it intelligible. It's like these wars that are happening in Africa and Eastern Europe, it's not because, um, it's, it, it's not because of any reason, it's because these societies, there is a deep-seated tribalism that is embedded in their society that the Cold War um, structure had put a lead on. Now that the Cold War has gone, we are in the place where we are seeing this catalytic exertion of long-suppressed ethno-identitarian violence into intractable conflicts. And this conflict then, and then he paints this wall in which 
the West is going to be like kind of stretched, put in a stretch limo. So, and then you have the rest of the world in the slums. And so now people saw this and was like, oh, he's saying that the West should barricade themselves. But what he was really saying is that if you are, if you have a, a limo in the, in the slums, you are going to be robbed. So it's better for you to actually go and try and contain that violence instead of um, basically pretending as if this violence, you know. So basically what he was saying, take on the white man's body. Even though he was misread, right? He was misread as calling for isolationism. But what he was actually saying, if you do not take up the white man's body and go and contain this conflict, it is going to come and destroy you. And then 9-11 happened and everybody, no, first Somalia. If you remember Black Hawk Down, the Americans went and they created this problem. You go to a country where there is a civil war. You didn't try to negotiate the conflict. You just said, General Farah, I did is the problem, and therefore they targeted him. And then that led to the Americans being killed and dragged on the streets and, and all of this, right? So that was the first. And then the second is that 9-11 happened. You see, I was telling you. So the Americans now ended up re rethinking the way in which we have to go to these societies and, and, and put a lead to this. So on the one hand, he provided a language that was very, made the conflict intelligible, but at the same time, he also redefined the conflict not as a security problem or social problem for the societies in which it was occurring, but as a security challenge for Western policymakers. You mm. have to go. If you do not go, this is going to happen. So Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, like all of this, but even Sierra Leone, Ivory Coast, Mali, these are all examples then that led the Americans and the, the Western Europe basically to take on the, the white man's body and now try and go and put this fire. And I'll end on this. The way in which those, the way they approached this conflict, it was more in terms of containment. What Robert, Robert Cox calls um, global poor relief and riot control. But they were the arsonists as well. So the arsonist is in charge because if you remember what I just said, um, the conflicts themselves emerge through a particular geopolitical move by the United States to try and redefine its position in the world, going after all of these governments. And, right? and when that happened, it led to conflict. Then the arsonist comes back and says, okay, now we have to put an end to this conflict, but we have to do it in a way in which we contain them where they are. Because if we do not, they are going to come harm us. And that explanation, even now in Russia with Ukraine, it's better. Listen, Lindsey Graham is basically saying it's better for us to fight them in Ukraine. He's saying that, right? Yeah. 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 No, I mean, I think that's really important. And the context of the white man's burden, it can't be overstated yeah. uh, how important that continues to be. But then also the point you made about being the arsonist, because in all of these conflicts, I mean, you have the situation where like the destabilization that is obviously like, a you know, uh, an outcome of colonialism, imperialism, all these economic policies, this attempt to control all of these places so we can continue to extract from them. Yep. Then the destabilization that causes is then invoked to justify further intervention. And yeah. you have this paper specifically about the issue of humanitarian intervention in Africa. It's called Empire's New Clothes, where you argue that, and I'm reading your words here, the Western world to, to domination disguises its violent imperialist pretensions under the cloak of benevolence and altru altruism. Mm -hmm. And you specifically look at the humanitarian intervention, uh, like I mentioned, in Africa. Can you explain this in the context of Libya? Um, and you mentioned as well, there were these parallel French military interventions taking place that we don't hear as much about, of course, in the US, like in the Ivory Coast. Um, mm -hmm. And the way these interventions as a whole were used to advance the reach of AFRICOM. But, you know, how did the intervention in Libya go on to then destabilize the re region, which was then used by Western policymakers to further justify even more intervention in <laughs> Africa? Like I mean, I was a kid when Libya, when Benghazi and, and Tripoli was bombed. Mm. I, I, I was a kid. I remember I was in school when Benghazi, so Reagan basically bombed Tripoli. The point, the reason why I'm doing this, saying this is because the Americans have always wanted to get rid of Gaddafi. Mm -hmm. And this is, and, and then I think I, I'm going to, on a tangent here, and I'll come to, to your question uh, um, Please. In, in, in a minute. <laughs> but, but the thing with Gaddafi, like, he gets presented as this deranged man, mm -hmm. this deranged detector that basically, right? 
But actually, if you take Gaddafi, the, the person, and study him, Gaddafi started as um, um, a Nasserist, as a Pan-Arabist. Mm -hmm. When Nasser was defeated and he died, Gaddafi then became, um, redefined himself through the Green Book Socialism, in which he basically was trying to fund revolutions in Africa in order to kick imperialist powers. So the Sierra Leonean civil war is partially implicated in that. And when Gaddafi realized that the way in which the, the, the groups that he was funding were also not the revolutionaries that he had imagined, then he redefined himself as um, a pan-Africanist. The, the, the AU is Gaddafi's brainchild. By the time Libya, Gaddafi died, Libya had between 150 and 200 billion investments in Africa. One of your, your guests recently, Essam, was talking about this, the way the wage bill has changed when you go to the Libya, Libyan um, 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 financial ministry and the budget and, and stuff, right? And so Gaddafi is not this crazy person. Whatever it is that you want to say about him, um, he may have governed in a way, you might find him eccentric, you might find him as a dictator, but he was not crazy. And there is this thing in the West where constantly anybody that we do not like, we question their mental capacity. Yeah. Even your friends, like people that you disagree with, the first thing, oh, you are crazy and, and this, right? So, so that, is, that, that is the first thing. But then... If you enjoyed this episode and want to hear the rest, you can access it by becoming a Breakthrough News member at patreon.com slash breakthrough news.